Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on GMO contamination, what's an organic farmer to do? In this webinar, Jim Riddle of the University of Minnesota will share ideas on how organic farmers can minimize genetic trespass during the planning, planting, production, harvest, storage, and transport of crops. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find information about upcoming webinars, as well as articles and videos on organic farming, on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website, along with all our many other archived webinars on organic farming topics. We're very glad to have Jim Riddle back with us online today from Minnesota. Jim has worked for over 26 years as an organic farmer, inspector, author, policy analyst, and educator. He was the founding chair of the International Organic Inspectors Association and has trained hundreds of organic inspectors throughout the world. Jim served on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Organic Advisory Task Force from 1991 to 2009, and he was instrumental in the passage of Minnesota's landmark organic certification cost share program. Since January 2006, Jim has worked as the University of Minnesota's Organic Outreach Coordinator. Jim is also the former chair of the USDA's National Organic Standards Board and is a leading voice for organic agriculture. After his 45-minute presentation, you will have the chance to ask him questions. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you don't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll read the questions out loud and answer as many as we have time for in the 30-minute question period following the presentation. Well, Jim, I'm going to hand over the screen control over to you now. So there'll be a slight delay, and then um, click on your screen once to activate it. And thanks, Alice, uh, for the introduction and for setting this up. And thanks, all of you, for joining us here today in another eOrganic webinar. I know there's a lot of interest in uh, the whole topic of GMOs and GMO contamination, uh, especially with the recent uh, deregulations of uh, uh, the genetically engineered alfalfa, the partial deregulation of uh, uh, genetically engineered sugar beets, and the deregulation of alpha amylase corn, uh, which contains uh, uh, enzyme to break down starches for ethanol production and is not to be used in food or feed. Um, what is an organic farmer to do? I will be focusing today on practical steps that organic farmers can take to minimize the contamination of their organic crops. Um, and then uh, after I've gone through that, I also will share some ideas for larger policy uh, changes at the national level to help prevent contamination. And what's an organic farmer to do? Well, I think uh, first off, you can choose to grow crops where there are no genetically engineered counterparts. Um, but you should be aware that uh, the crops currently that are approved in genetically engineered form are various types of corn, um, uh, some with herbicide resistant traits and some containing a pesticide uh, toxin derived from Bacillus thuringiensis and now the uh, alpha amylase corn for ethanol. But there's also uh, cotton, canola, soybeans, uh, sugar beets I mentioned, uh, Hawaiian papaya, um, a couple varieties of summer squash, and the Roundup Ready uh, alfalfa. Uh, so if you choose to grow crops in any of those uh, types of species or, or varieties, um, then these are some steps to help you minimize uh, contamination. As an organic farmer, you need to really know the uh, uh, sources of the seeds that you're using. Um, the regulations state that you must use organic seeds if they're commercially available in the form, quality, quantity, and equivalent variety that you need on your farm. If you can not find organic seeds from organic seed suppliers and you've documented your attempts to source organic seed, then you are allowed, allowed to use untreated 
uh, conventionally grown seeds. Um, the regulation is very clear that you must not use genetically engineered seeds, and uh, uh, those are defined in the regulation as excluded methods, and I'll share that definition in a moment. Um, and then also be aware that there are some uh, rhizobial inoculants uh, that are genetically engineered. One particular brand is called Dormal Plus. Uh, that would not be allowed uh, for inoculating legume seeds used in organic systems. But regular non-GMO inoculants are allowed and certainly are a good idea if you're growing a legume uh, in soil that hasn't grown that type of legume before uh, to have the rhizobial inoculant colony uh, in, in the soil. So you want to uh, contact your you know, seed suppliers, and especially if you're using the non-organic untreated seed, uh, you need to get uh, statements from the seed suppliers verifying the non-GMO status of the seeds that you're using. If you're using organic seed, you need verification that you're sourcing organic seed as well. Um, it's a good idea to ask the seed supplier uh, for copies of test results or a statement um, that the seeds have been tested. And it's really important that the seeds be tested for each of the events or traits or modifications. Since some seeds, like I mentioned, the corn, may have different traits or they may have stacked traits in the same variety. And so not just one test covers all traits. There's a separate test for each trait. Uh, so you, uh, this is especially the case if you're looking at planting corn, soy, canola, cotton, sugar beets, or alfalfa. Make sure and retain copies of those test results as well as copies of your receipts, the seed tags themselves, and any letters from your seed suppliers. Uh, you'll keep those in your record file for review during the organic inspection. It's really important that organic producers understand the regulation itself. As I mentioned, organic farmers are prohibited from using any genetically engineered products, uh, including seeds, planting stocks such as the Hawaiian papaya, inoculants like I mentioned, or the recombinant bovine somatotropin uh, hormone that's injected into conventional dairy cattle. That, of course, is not allowed in organic dairy production. And the regulation uh, uh, talks about GMOs as excluded methods. And this is the definition from the National Organic Program final rule uh, of excluded methods, defined as a variety of methods used to genetically modify organisms or influence their growth and development by means that are not possible under natural conditions or processes and are not considered compatible with organic production. Such methods include cell fusion, micro-encapsulation, and macro-encapsulation, and recombinant DNA technology, including gene deletion, gene doubling, introducing a foreign gene, and changing the positions of genes when achieved by recombinant DNA technology. Excluded methods do not include the use of traditional breeding, conjugation, fermentation, hybridization, in vitro fertilization, or tissue culture. So those last methods are allowed for uh, breeding of crops used in organic systems, but certainly not the recombinant D DNA technology uh, that's common in the crops that have been approved at the federal level uh, recently. And I should also mention the regulation in Section 205.105E that clearly states that organic products must be produced and handled without the use of excluded methods. And then it says, except for vaccines, provided that the vaccines are approved in accordance with 205-600-A, which is the national list process that requires that uh, anything be added to the national list has to go through petition, review by the National Organic Standards Board, 
published in the Federal Register, and then be added to the national list of allowed substances. And to date, no GMO vaccines have been petitioned, and none appear on the national list. Uh, but the door is open for their consideration. But there's no other GMOs or excluded methods that uh, can even be considered uh, to be added to the national list. And the regulation also empowers certification agents and government officials to uh, uh, take samples and tests of both crops and inputs if there's reason to suspect that they, that they were produced using excluded methods. And so if a farmer is growing uh, organic seed crops, certified organic, certified seed, and those seeds um, are contaminated, uh, through drift or insect pollination um, and are tested and found to be uh, a GMO, to contain excluded methods. Um, the use of an excluded method is prohibited, but not necessarily the presence under the regulation. And so uh, the farm producing those would not necessarily lose their certification, but another farmer who needs to use organic seed and cannot use GMO seed, could not use these contaminated seeds. Uh, and this applies to other types of ingredients and feed further up the line, up the chain in the organic system. So you need to take a good uh, look at your own farm. Uh, know which fields uh, are particularly isolated, well-suited, uh, um, especially if you're growing crops that are susceptible to GMO contamination, things that are wind or insect pollinated in particular, selecting isolated fields on your farm for planting uh, those type of crops. Know what the prevailing winds are as you make that assessment and selection. And uh, just as you need to do to help protect your crops from uh, chem chemical trespass or uh, pesticide contamination, uh, establishing good thick buffer zones, wind breaks, hedgerows uh, to help minimize pollen drift. Um, I think this probably is most effective for uh, um, preventing pesticide drift, also uh, preventing soil erosion, providing wildlife habitat, habitat for beneficials, so it's a good idea. Um, and might help minimize GMO contamination, but it's certainly not in and of itself going to prevent um, uh, contamination. One of the best uh, things to do when uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, preventing contamination, whether it's from pesticides or GMOs, is to have uh, good lines of communication with your neighbors. Um, letting your neighbors know that you're growing organic, non-GMO crops, and uh, if needed, posting organic farm signs along the border as a reminder. Uh, many farms have employees who may or may not uh, know that the neighboring farm is being operated organic, uh, so signs might help re as a reminder there. But signs should never be the, your first line of defense. Establishing good lines of communication with neighbors is always a good idea and certainly can go a long way uh, to help them understand what you're trying to do and what constraints you're under, and then uh, establishing good uh, cooperation, and then also understanding what they're growing. Are they growing GMO crops? If so, which crops are they? Are they the, they the same? species of crops that you're growing on your land. Um, and if your neighbor is growing Bt corn, under the federal uh, requirements for Bt corn, uh, the farmer growing that, that crop is required to plant a refuge uh, somewhere on the farm. And that refuge is a non-Bt corn that is uh, designed to be included you know, up to 20% of the acres in non-BT corn to provide a refuge for the 
uh, European corn borer or possibly the corn rootworm to live in to minimize the development of resistance in the insect population. If that's the case, if your neighbor is growing Bt corn, uh, you might ask the neighbor to put that refuge acre uh, acreage along your border to help provide a buffer on the neighbor's land between the Bt crop and your crop. But I understand now that uh, some of the seed companies are selling bags of mixed Bt corn seed with the non-BT right in the same bag. So up to 20% of the bag may be non-BT, and those are just scattered throughout the field. And that um, defeats the whole purpose of a refuge uh, because the, uh, the, the insects often will not even find the non-BT corn. But it also uh, serves you no good um, if it's pre-mixed in the bag because the uh, neighboring farmer uh, couldn't uh, set aside that refuge along your border. We also, uh, it's good to know what the planting dates uh, that your neighbors are uh, following. And oftentimes, a conventional farmer is working the land uh, when it's colder, when it's wetter, uh, then the organic farmer is waiting for the soil to warm up because they're using untreated seed. And um, that's a good strategy as well to prevent GMO contamination, is to delay your planting date, if possible, uh, so that the neighbor's crop pollinates uh, before your crop pollinates. And two weeks um, is certainly a good time frame between the neighbor's planting date and your planting date if that makes sense agronomically and you still have sufficient days and heat units to get the yield you need on your organic farm. You also need to really uh, take a good look at your equipment and uh, make sure that all planters, combines, hay balers, trucks, wagons, etc., are thoroughly clean before they're used for planting or harvesting or transporting organic crops. Uh, this is especially important with any rented equipment or if you have custom equipment coming onto your farm that may have been used on conventional operations. Um, that equipment needs to be thoroughly cleaned and emptied before it's used on uh, your organic farm so that you don't have any seeds from the previous conventional crop uh, being planted on your farm, because then that would be introducing the excluded methods or GMOs directly onto your farm. And then harvesting equipment as well. Uh, say if you're growing grain crops uh, uh, and having someone custom combine for you, uh, that custom combiner needs to understand that the equipment needs to be thoroughly clean. So that means opening all the traps, sieves, uh, augers, hoppers, and uh, blowing with compressed air, uh, vacuuming um, with a shop vac, and doing everything possible to uh, empty the combine prior to the organic harvest. But then it's even a good idea to follow up and harvest a little bit of the organic field, then purge uh, or flush out the combine with that first organic crop. That gets set aside and not sold as organic. But that's a, uh, an important step because no matter how good a job you do to try and clean the unit, there's usually some grain left in there. And uh, the purging can push that grain on through the unit. And then you can start up with the organic harvest. Because it doesn't take many uh, GMO grains uh, uh, to turn an otherwise organic load uh, into a GMO load um, and, and test positive. So make sure and keep records of those cleaning activities. And uh, you, know, you want to sh share those with the inspector. But also, if you run into any problems and your uh, crops test positive, 
you will have evidence that you've done everything in your power to clean all equipment uh, before it was used for harvesting or transporting or storing your crops. If, uh, if you are growing ch crops that are um, susceptible to GMO contamination, you might want to look at testing prior to harvest. And if contamination is likely, uh, it's a good idea to take those samples of the standing crop in a grid pattern where you collect uh, samples from the border areas where it's the highest risk keep those samples separate, come farther into the field and take another batch of samples and keep those separate and, and on into the field in kind of a grid pattern. Have those samples tested separately, whether it's uh, working with a professional test GMO testing service or uh, if you work with your local elevator or your buyer or have um, test strips yourself. But if you do this grid pattern type sampling and GMOs are found on the outer edges but not, you know, say 12 rows into a field, then you can proceed with confidence during your harvest uh, with the organic harvest but not mix in those outer rows which um, may have uh, been contaminated. Uh, so it can help in, inform you of the level of contamination and isolate those contaminated grains so that they don't contaminate all of your crops. Uh, and make sure, once again, to have those samples tested for all applicable traits. Retain duplicate copies of the samples themselves so that if there's ever a reason to suspect that the lab was incorrect or you want to have them retested, you still have original samples. So don't send the entire sample into a lab, but retain uh, duplicate samples. And then, of course, retain records of all the test results um, you know, that show uh, where the contamination was the highest all the way to where there was zero contamination. If you're growing a crop that you're going to store on farm or uh, at some you know, uh, rented facility, you want to make sure that that crop storage unit is thoroughly clean and inspected uh, um, prior to use. So um, you know, vacuuming, blowing down, sweeping, taking pictures of the clean unit, uh, that this was the unit, the, the sh condition of the unit before it was filled with the organic crop. And make sure that GMO crops are not stored in the same vicinity, that they're not running through the same elevators, augers, grain legs, um, and handling equipment. And even uh, dust from GMO crops can contaminate non-GMO crops and uh, turn up with a positive sample. So uh, uh, make sure to clean everything thoroughly, not just the storage bin itself, but every piece of equipment that's used to harvest I mean, and handle the crop uh, before it goes in and then before it comes out of the storage unit as, as well. And once again, document those cleaning activities. And as I suggested, you might want to take some pictures before you ship any crops off of your farm, whether it's with your own trucks and trailers or, or if you're using a contracted carrier, uh, any transport unit, including overseas shipping containers, has to be inspected and thoroughly cleaned prior to loading with your organic crop. Make sure that it's free of any loose grain, any dust, or other foreign materials. And this applies also to any tarps that are used to cover uh, grain trucks, for instance. Those tarps can retain grain or dust that then could contaminate your, uh, your load. Keep records of those cleaning activities 
and uh, organic certifiers often have uh, clean transport affidavit forms uh, for you to use to document these transport cleaning activities or uh, that activity may be recorded on the bill of lading when the load is uh, filled and shipped from your farm. Keep good records. Uh, document all these attempts that I've spoken of uh, to minimize con GMO contamination, uh, including that non-GMO seed verification, any test results of either seed or the crop itself, uh, how you notified your neighbors. If you sent a letter, keep a copy of that letter. Um, records of your equipment and storage unit and transport unit inspection and cleaning activities. Also keep copies of your records of the crop yields and sales. And this is especially important if you do uh, suffer harm. If you suffer losses, having good records of you performing due diligence uh, to prevent contamination, but also records of your previous crop yields and organic sales can really help you establish claims for losses uh, should contamination occur. So it's not just your word against someone else's. You have records uh, to show what your activities have been and what your history of organic crop yields and sales has been. You also need to be in touch with your buyers. If you're growing organic crops under contract, it's important to know if your buyers have additional contract specifications for GMO uh, uh, levels, thresholds or rejection levels. As I mentioned, the use of GMOs is prohibited under the National Organic Regulation, but the presence is not. However, mo many buyers are testing uh, for various GMO traits and are rejecting loads. And even though the crop remains certified organic, the buyer can reject it if it, is, it exceeds the uh, threshold set in a contract or in their uh, uh, buying agreement with you. Know and also make sure and follow what your buyer's sampling and testing protocols are. Often they will want crop samples before they will agree to receive the load and there may be samples before uh, your product is unloaded at their facility. And it's good if you've kept samples at your farm before the truck leaves because if there's any question you can compare your sample to the sample and the results um, at the other end before it's unloaded at your buyer's facility. And if your buyer has additional certifications, uh, requirements on top of uh, the NOP certification, uh, you need to be aware of that in advance and follow whatever protocols, whatever inspection uh, needed to occur during the growing season or any other additional documentation. Um, there's one project called the Non-GMO Project that is uh, additional to organic certification. But if your buyer is selling into foreign markets, uh, they may have additional certifications or thresholds in effect that cannot be exceeded in order for them to accept and pay you for your uh, crop. So understanding if there are market-driven GMO rejection levels is very important. But also staying in communication with your buyers. Um, if you do have concerns or you aren't clear on what their uh, specifications or contract requirements are, it's certainly a good idea uh, to um, be in, in communication with them. It's a good idea also to talk with your insurance agent uh, to see if your farm insurance policy covers GMO contamination losses. It's quite likely that it does not, but it's a good idea, idea to ask the question and just see if, uh, if your uh, crop insurance 
covers these kinds of losses. If your neighbors are growing GMOs, does their insurance cover genetic drift or harm that might be caused? When the uh, neighboring farmer plants GMO crops, they typically sign some sort of licensing agreement or even by opening the bag of GMO seed, uh, they may be obligated and uh, 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 to the requirements of a licensing agreement even if they did not sign that. And those licensing agreements may pass on uh, the kind of liability for harm to the buyer, I mean to the um, farmer who's growing that crop. However, the biotech company that developed this technology actually retains ownership of the transgenic DNA. The neighboring farmer plants the seeds, but the biotech company still owns that DNA. And um, it's a good idea to ask your neighbor if they have asked the supplier of the seed what kind of coverage uh, is provided um, by the biotech company for any losses that may be caused by their technology causing harm to a neighboring producer. And it's important to note that the uh, BT crops are actually registered with the Environmental Protection Agency as pesticides. Um, so every seed is a pesticide, and that pesticide goes through every cell of the plant. So the the crop residues are pesticidal, the pollen is pesticidal, and uh, uh, one thing to look at, if uh, uh, you have suffered harm from a BT crop contamination, is whether that uh, pesticide that has drifted onto your farm is a violation of uh, state pesticide trespass regulations. Um, and uh, if so, uh, you may have evidence of harm of pesticide trespass uh, due to the BT toxin, which, as I said, is a registered pesticide with the EPA. Now I'm going to shift gears a bit. I work part-time for the University of Minnesota. I also work with the National Organic Coalition, and um, uh, they have put together seven steps to fair farming. And these are available at the nationalorganiccoalition.org website. Um, so these are some more big picture steps to help minimize uh, GMO contamination on organic farms. So uh, National Organic Coalition, number one, is calling for the USDA to establish a public breeds institute to ensure that the public has access to high quality non-GMO breeds and germplasm. And that's something that has been diminishing over time is the investment in public plant breeding as the private sector has stepped up with the whole GMO technology. Uh, number two, NOC is uh, uh, calling for the creation of a contamination compensation fund uh, to be funded by the GMO patent holders that would provide immediate assistance to persons who suffer contamination from GMOs throughout the entire uh, production system from the seed to the table. And that's something that uh, does not exist at this time. They're calling on the uh, USDA to eliminate the quote unquote deregulated status for GMOs and uh, to have ongoing oversight so there is continued regulation and public evaluation of the compliance and enforcement. Um, and it's not just a, uh, a, a total approval and then uh, USDA hands the authority over to the biotech company for any conditions uh, such as keeping this new uh, uh, alpha, alpha amylase corn out of food and feed systems, which is the case right now with the uh, de deregulation of that corn that's supposed to be used only for ethanol. So they're calling on continued regulation even when uh, crops, GMO crops, are approved. They're asking uh, for comprehensive, independent longitudinal studies on the health, environmental, and socioeconomic impacts of GMOs 
prior to GMO crop approvals, and uh, that currently is not the case. Uh, they're really ha the uh, uh, research that's done is conducted by uh, the biotech companies themselves and submit their research findings to the three different government agencies, uh, but the agencies themselves have not uh, conducted uh, tests, and there have been no long-term uh, human health tests, for instance, and those tests have not been done uh, by independent bodies. So that's something um, that the National Organic Coalition is calling for. They're also uh, calling on a for a prohibition on the growing of promiscuous GM crops that are highly likely to cause GMO contamination. So crops that are wind pollinated or insect pollinated, uh, that um, it's totally predictable that they will cause harm to neighboring crops and, and contaminate them because of their promiscuous nature of the way that they uh, pollinate. The National Organic Coalition is also uh, calling for uh, 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 preventing food security risks that are associated with the concentration in the food system uh, of, in the hands of just a few companies. And this is something that is also being looked at by the Justice Department in the whole area of uh, concentration and monopoly uh, statutes. And uh, National Organic Coalition is calling for an immediate uh, uh, labeling protocol for all GMO crops products and ingredients, and that's something that is in place in a number of other countries but is not in place in this country and would go a long way to help uh, prevent uh, contamination of organic crops. So here are some websites uh, for further information. If you would like to read the organic regulation, uh, you can find that at the top website, the ams.usda.gov uh, website. And uh, at that NOP site, you will find a link to the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations. And that always contains the most current copy, or the current copy, of the National Organic Program Final Rule. It has been amended since it went into effect in 2002. Uh, so make sure you're not working from an old paper copy. But on the issue of GMOs, uh, there have not been any changes since the rule uh, was originally uh, uh, released. And I should point out that when the first proposed rule uh, was published in the Federal Register at the end of 1997, it did propose the consideration of GMOs and the use of sewage sludge and irradiation, antibiotics, and feeding slaughter byproducts, and a number of practices and inputs that had historically been prohibited in organic production. And the number one issue uh, for people in commenting was the whole GMO issue. And the USDA received 275,000 negative comments. And that set a new record for any proposed rule by USDA. And uh, you know they did go back and rework that and make it very clear that the use of GMOs is prohibited in organic production. Um, but that, I think, uh, uh, sent a very strong message to, to the USDA that uh, the organic farming community, consumers, uh, did not want genetic engineering in organic. And, and because genetically engineered crops and products do not have to be labeled, the organic label is really the only uh, label in the marketplace that prohibits the use of GMOs. So a few other websites here on the list. Uh, the Genetic ID is just one company that offers uh, testing for transgenic traits. Uh, there are others, but I just put that up as one example. And then I mentioned earlier the Non-GMO Project. Um, that's their website. And they are doing an additional certification to organic because, as I said, organic prohibits the use, but not necessarily the presence. And so uh, this project is looking at the end products and 
uh, companies that participate are having to set up protocols all the way back to the farm level to assure that they're keeping GMOs out, but they're also are testing at various levels in the process. And uh, a number of companies are participating in uh, this non-GMO project. So you can find out more at that website. The Center for Food Safety is uh, uh, an activist organization that has uh, you know, taken the USDA to court on some of the recent approvals. And if you would like to follow uh, their work, um, you can do that from their website. Uh, the non-GMO report is a, a publication. Uh, the organic and non-GMO report is a, uh, the name of the publication, but that's the website uh, where you can access that. They do have a print magazine as well as a non-GMO source book that they publish annually. But on your website, on that website, you can find uh, listings of various companies that both supply organic and non-GMO products as well as buyers and uh, uh, different services that do testing. The Organic Center is a, a nonprofit organization that funds research on organic production methods and has uh, uh, looked into the whole claim of uh, the reduction of pesticide use since GMOs were introduced and found that there's actually been an increase in pesticide use, along with the whole development of herbicide-resistant weeds, which are now over 20 species of weeds that are resistant to glyphosate and other herbicides uh, because of the uh, uh, release of and the common spraying of uh, the pesticides due to the herbicide resistance that's been uh, um, uh, inserted into the DNA of certain crops. And then uh, the National Organic Coalition uh, is where you can find those seven steps to fair farming as well as other work that they're doing. That's a coalition of a number of organizations such as Rural Advancement Foundation International, Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service, uh, Center for Food Safety, National Co-op Grocery Association, and others. Um, uh, working together uh, to have a voice for organic agriculture. And this is just a, a representative sample. There are also many other groups, companies, organizations uh, which have good information about uh, GMO issues and organic issues. And then finally, uh, there's the website I manage for the University of Minnesota, organicecology.umn.edu. So I think I'll stop there and would be happy to take any questions. Hi, this is Alice again. Um, we're about to start our question and answer period, but before we do, we're just going to launch very two quick um, 20 to 30 second poll question to ask um, whether any of the farmers in our audience think they've suffered any crop losses as a result of GMO contamination, and if so, which crops. So I'm just going to launch that very quickly. And um, I'll just keep it up for about 20 seconds. And um, if you're a farmer, you can just quickly vote in there. And um, have it up just a few more seconds. And then um, I'll launch the next one to find out which crop. And then I just wanted to remind anybody who missed the beginning of the presentation that when we have our question and answer period, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. And if you don't see the question box, yeah, and we'll be reading the questions out loud and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Okay, let me just um, get the next one. Okay, Let's see if I can, oh good, it's sharing the results there. Okay, and um, let me launch the next one. Okay, just a second. All right, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. The next one is not opening, but let's move on. I may be able to get that one. Let's see if I, I okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, here's the next one. Um, 
which crop, if you answered yes to the last question, um, in what crop have you had losses? Okay, I'm just going to close that one. Okay, so we have 50% corn and 50% soybeans. Okay, all right, well, let's move on to the question and answer. Um, let's see, first question, Jim. Um, I would like to hear Jim speak about why the burden of protection has been put on one group of growers while preference has been given to another. Well, yes, that, uh, that's a good question, and historically that has been the framework for organic production. I uh, worked as an organic inspector for 20 years, and that was a common question, what, you know, not related to GMOs originally, but chemical contamination. Why should the organic farmer have to uh, have a buffer? Why should the uh, organic farmer um, take land out of organic production that they're paying taxes on but yet cannot uh, have the benefit of growing organic crops on all of their acres? And um, it really, I, I don't have a good answer. I wish I did. It's not fair. It's not uh, allowing the... Uh, organic producer full access and really to enjoy uh, the benefits of land ownership and to you know control uh, their own uh, lives and this has now expanded you know way beyond the chemical contaminants to the GMOs. Now in most states there are uh, statutes against chemical trespass that if a farmer suffers harm and has evidence of that harm, uh, uh, that uh, there can be an investigation and prosecution and the neighbor or the uh, applicator um, is liable. And there's typically applicators uh, or conventional farmers um, have been found responsible for chemical contamination, uh, but the um, this has not been tested, uh, uh, especially, as I mentioned, the possibility for the BT crops, which are a pesticide. It would be interesting to see how that uh, would test out when someone has evidence of harm or losses. But the regulation, the organic regulation, does say that organic farmers do have, have responsibility to uh, um, take steps, including buffer zones, to protect their crops from contamination. But that doesn't mean that uh, contamination, contamination won't occur, whether it's from GMOs. Uh, but, you know, organic has been a small part of the agricultural landscape and certainly uh, a minor voice in Washington, D.C. and in state capitals where uh, agricultural policies are set. And I think uh, you know, we've come a long way to develop this, the organic sector, uh, but we've had to do it from a minority position and haven't had the access to and, and the influence, the lobbyists, the PR firms, the lawyers, et cetera, that both the uh, chemical industry and now the ag biotech industry has uh, as far as influence over policy. Okay, um, next question. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to say, if you need to leave early, um, if you can't stay for the whole question and answer period, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted within the coming week on our website under archived webinars at the address on your screen. Um, and if after the webinar you have additional questions or questions that haven't been answered, you're welcome to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask and you'll get an answer. Um, finally, we also really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey for the webinar, which you'll be receiving today in an email. So on to the next question. Um, how are GMO producers or users being held liable for contamination of others' properties? Well, um, for the most part, they are not. Um, and as I just dis discussed it earlier, you know, the burden is on the organic or other types of non-GMO identity preserved producers because there's a lot of them out there as well. You know, it's not just organic producers that are 
uh, you know, suffering harm and being contaminated. Uh, but the lack of any kind of uh, you know, liability for harm is why the National Organic Coalition has that as one of their, you know, seven steps at the, you know, kind of national level that is needed to have a comp compensation fund, to have some kind of crop insurance that covers the organic and non-GMO identity preserve producer and preserves their right to farm uh, without uh, contamination. And so uh, this is something I think is common sense and, and should be in place, uh, but at the current time it's not. Okay, we have a couple questions about preventative measures. Um, the first one is about windbreaks. Are windbreaks effective for reducing cross-pollination um, from contamination of G from GMO crops? And if so, could you recommend a reference for minimum requirements? Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, windbreaks are certainly effective for um, uh, you know slowing down wind and preventing erosion uh, uh, you know wind erosion that's the you know the most effective and where most of the development in science has been uh, but they provide a a screen a, a visual uh, barrier as well but um, if the uh, crop on the neighboring GMO field is a wind pollinated crop and uh, you have a, a multi-story, multi-species windbreak that certainly will help uh, uh, slow the wind and, and, in, and drop some of the pollen uh, just as it helps slow and, and drop any uh, soil particles that are caught on the wind. Uh, I haven't seen and I'm not aware of actual research about the effectiveness of uh, uh, windbreaks to prevent uh, um, GMO uh, contamination. And this is something where I anticipate uh, uh, there will be more research in the future is what types of windbreaks are most effective. Um, and uh, what are most effective for chemical uh, contamination as well. But if you go to your local Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS office, they do have uh, uh, programs, cost share programs, to help establish windbreaks or field borders. They have practice standards that need to be followed. Uh, uh, if you are wanting to put in some kind of a field border or hedgerow, uh, they do have um, cost share as well as technical uh, assistance and expertise to help you design and plant a multi-species, multi-story type of windbreak. So I definitely encourage you to go to the NRCS. There was just a national sign-up uh, uh, under the in Environmental Quality Incentive Program, which does have a special category for organic and transitioning farmers called the Organic Initiative. Um, uh, but there was just a scoring period uh, that ended last Friday, March 4th. However, the sign-up uh, is continuous. So even though you've just missed this round uh, of funding, the uh, sign-ups are there, the doors are open, the technical assistance is available, and you can make an application and really come up with a plan for your farm and identify which fields really would benefit from windbreaks or other types of hedgerows or field borders. So I do encourage you to uh, go visit, and there are NRCS offices in every agricultural county in the country. Okay, um, here's a question. Consumers have publicly stated continued support of maintaining non-GMOs in organics. Have you seen or heard of any NOP or NOSB change in this regard? Um, no, I, I uh, have not. Um, the only thing I'm aware of, I, I, it was mentioned earlier when you introduced me that I served a five-year term on the National Organic Standards Board, and uh, at that time tried to bring up the issue of uh, thresholds or presence uh, and setting limits. There's a, for chemical contamination, if an organic crop 
is found to be contaminated with a pesticide, um, there's a limit that it can no longer be sold as organic if it's tested and found to have over 5% of the EPA tolerance for that pesticide on that crop. There's nothing comparable as far as a threshold or rejection level for organic products being contaminated by GMOs. And when I tried to bring up that topic, at that time the USDA was not open to even having a discussion. It's my understanding that at least now there's more of an openness to uh, have the discussion. And I don't know whether that should be zero tolerance or if it should be comparable to the threshold set in you know, some of the foreign markets, such as Europe. Um, but there at least should be a discussion. Uh, so that, you know, so that the organic farmer is kind of caught in this no man's land right now where the use is prohibited, but if contamination occurs, it's not a regulatory violation, but yet the markets will reject that product and it can't be used by anyone else as an organic uh, ingredient or organic seed because it now is a product of genetic engineering because it's uh, tested and found uh, to contain GMOs. And so you know, that's the only area where I see the, the possibility of discussion. I'm not aware of any NOSB members or draft uh, recommendations calling for a change in the regulation and an allowance for uh, GMOs in organic. There was a discussion of the issue of vaccines in the last couple years by the NOSB. Um, and that issue, I, I would say, is still on the table of whether uh, GMO vaccines are allowed or not. And it's my understanding, as I pointed out early on, that vaccines, GMO vaccines, could be considered, but they would have to be petitioned and go through the whole national list process. And to date, none have, and I'm not aware of any petitions that uh, kind of are in the pipeline. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions about refuges and buffers. Um, well, the first one is, could you further explain the refuge area required by BT corn planters? And then another question I want to know whether there are specific buffers for different GMO crops that you would recommend to prevent GMO contamination on neighboring farms. Yeah, well, um, uh, on the, uh, uh, the refuge for the BT corn traits, um, part of the agreement uh, when they were deregulated uh, and uh, approved by EPA was that the biotech companies agreed that they would uh, uh, require farmers who planted their seeds to plant a, a refuge of non-BT corn. And the theory here is that having some non-BT corn in the field will keep the, uh, the European corn borer, in the first instance, um, uh, susceptible to the toxin, that there will be populations that survive and breed. And uh, if all of the crop is, contains the BT gene, it increases the likelihood that a few insects would survive the toxin, breed, and then develop resistant populations. And that actually is happening uh, somewhat in uh, the BT cotton, but I'm not aware of it happening yet with the uh, BT corn. But uh, so that's kind of the, the framework, uh, is a theory to prevent um, or to slow down resistance development. and. Uh, um, but the responsibility for implementing that was handed over to the uh, biotech companies themselves rather than the EPA or the USDA or state departments of agriculture. Um, and then I have recently been told by farmers that, uh, you know, that, well, there's several things going on. One is, uh, you know, a lot of farmers make, you know, uh, uh, the choice to put that refuge in the middle of their fields 
because then uh, any of the corn borer moths would first light on the Bt crops and consume uh, the corn or plant their eggs there and the uh, uh, larvae which actually do the boring uh, would die and they would never get to the refuge so it kind of defeated the purpose of maintaining a refuge if it's planted on the inner rows and now I've been told that uh, the, the seeds are actually blended together and once again that will uh, defeat the purpose. Um, but as far as what is an adequate buffer, uh, well, for corn seed breeders, uh, it's really recommended 660 feet minimum between varieties if you are wanting to maintain the purity of a certain variety of corn seed. That's the minimum distance. So that really is a fairly predictable distance that pollen will travel. Um, now, should, I mean, it, 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 there's no way that an organic farmer or a non-GMO uh, farmer would maintain a 660-foot buffer on their farm. Um, and uh, the GMO farmers are certainly not maintaining that kind of isolation distance from their uh, BT crops or other uh, types of traits uh, uh, between the, the, those GMO corn varieties and non-GMO corn. But that's what it's really recommended in the, in the seed industry. So it's pretty extensive. And that's a wind-pollinated crop. And then if you're looking at insect-pollinated crops, uh, like the, the Roundup Ready alfalfa that's recently been uh, deregulated, um, the bees will travel you know, four miles uh, in a radius from their hive to collect pollen and nectar. And so there, uh, it, you're looking at a, a, a huge contamination potential uh, when uh, you know, insects are the pollinators. So it's much larger than with wind pollination even. OK, we have a question on how you can test for GMO contamination, where you can do a test, and how much it costs. Yeah, well. Um, there are test strips that you can buy um, and for various traits. Uh, um, and those are you know, relatively inexpensive, like uh, you know, $15, where you need to grind up the grain, mix it with distilled water, and then insert a test strip. And those are in the range of being like 95% accurate. They won't tell you levels of contamination. They will just say whether that trait is present or not. But when you look at the uh, more advanced testing, uh, such as you know the various grain buyers use or uh, elevators might have, especially if they have set up a you know non-GMO receiving station, uh, um, you know that. Uh, equipment and, well, to have the test run may be more in the range of $300. So it gets very, uh, you know, cost prohibitive to do a whole lot of testing. But the, uh, the test strips are, um, you know, affordable and simple to use, but they have limitations as far as their both accuracy and the fact they don't tell you levels of the, of the trait that are present. OK, and she wanted to know where you might find something like that. Yeah, well, um, uh, if you go back to the uh, website, the uh, uh, non-GMO report, in their source book, they list various uh, labs that do testing. Um, in their magazine, uh, they often have ads for uh, you know, here I have a copy, so let me just look and see um, if I uh, uh, of companies that do I offer test strips. I'm sorry, I wasn't uh, didn't have this right in front of me. Um, here's one uh, SGS, uh, and their website is seedservices.sgs.com. 
Um, they do uh, uh, GMO uh, testing of plant seeds, grains. Uh, that's one company. Um, let's see if any others jump out at me right away here. But going to that non-GMO report and looking at their source book uh, is where you can find a much more complete listing. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any of the other testing labs uh, that are advertising in this particular issue. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go for another couple of questions. Um, let's see. Um, what discussions have occurred on the issue of GMO transfer into livestock products like dairy? Yeah, there's been very little research, um, and that, that's something that, uh, you know, the, the biotech companies have not been required to do as part of the registration process is look at uh, ingestion by livestock or by humans. Um, and uh, um, there have been uh, uh, certainly some concerns recently with the Roundup-ready crops and causing uh, or, or uh, the possibility that uh, spontaneous abortions and other types of uh, you know health effects, negative health effects, uh, are occurring in livestock either from consumption of the uh, GMO crop uh, itself or uh, the uh, residues of Roundup that are associated with that Roundup Ready crop. Uh, then causing harm to livestock that are consuming those. And uh, yeah, a Dr. Don Huber, who's a uh, professor emeritus from Purdue University, if you do a search for his name, you'll find uh, some of the concerns that he has uh, published, primarily in European journals, is where there's been more um, uh, examination of, of these kind of uh, health effects. Okay, we had a question of where folks can go for a listing of uh, GMOs released on the market. Um, he suggested the Union of Concerned Scientists website. Yes, that's a very good. And uh, yes, I should have mentioned them. They also are involved in the National Organic Coalition, but they do have a listing. And there's also a listing on that uh, non-GMO report website. But yes, the Union of Concerned Scientists has uh, you know, looked at the various uh, GMO issues and have come to the same conclusion as the Organic Center that they've actually led to an increase in the application of pesticides since their introduction. Okay. I'm not sure I completely understand this question, but it says, I recently learned that IP corn and soybean seed is permitted to contain 1% and 0.5% of um, GMO contamination. Is, is it not time for organic seed only to be used? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. And the IP part re refers to identity preserved. And those are market-driven um, uh, thresholds or rejection levels uh, that the uh, you know, question is about. And um, yes, that, uh, that corn it would not be allowed for organic where the use of Organic seed is required, number one. If you can't find it, like I said, um, and you document those efforts, you can use a conventional but non-GMO seed. And uh, um, if, if it has 1% contamination, that's not a non-GMO seed, and, and that would be introducing an excluded method. Uh, to use the terminology of the NOP. That would be the use of an excluded method. And so uh, it certainly reinforces the need for more organic seed breeding and for organic farmers to be very aggressive in their use of organic seeds and demanding uh, organic seeds. But um, this is an area of concern in the organic seed industry because some of the seed suppliers are sitting on stocks of organic seed uh, where the producers, the organic producers, are not um, you know, doing their due diligence to uh, try to source organic seeds for all of their organic crops. 
Okay. Um, next question. Has there been any reported study or studies? Um, let's see. I'm trying to... Okay. To compare mixed GMO and non-GMO seeds versus unmixed or separate plantings of GMO and non-GMO refugia, and what were the findings? Yeah, I'm not aware of, uh, of studies on the effectiveness of refugia strategies and, uh, you know, what types of mixes um, or planting, uh, you know, uh, grids are effective and uh, if they truly are achieving that, uh, you know, theoretical goal of, of preventing or slowing down the, uh, you know, resistant, uh, BT resistant uh, insect populations. If someone is aware of those, I'd love to uh, hear about you know, that kind of research. Okay, um, we have a question. Um, so many of us here in this webinar are non-farmers. Our attention and concern should be harvested. What are the best actions we can take to aid farmers and protect the integrity of the organic food stream? Yeah, well, that uh, you know gets certainly at the issue of, of advocacy, and that's you know not my role here or my, or, uh, my goal. But I, I do encourage you to check out the Center for Food Safety. Uh, they have been a leading activist organization in this, and I think if you go to their website, uh, you'll find some good tips on uh, steps that you can take. Okay, um, here's a comment. Um, a uh, listener has inspected organic farms in Hawaii where the grower saved papaya seed from store-bought fruit, planted the seeds, and they were tested positive for GMO. What's the consequence to the organic production area? Well, um, it, most is my understanding. I have never had the pleasure of being in Hawaii, and it's snowing here in Minnesota, so it sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> but uh, um, it's my understanding that uh, most of the papaya is uh, the GMO planting stock. So if someone is, you know, uh, saving seed from papaya they purchased in the grocery store, it's going to be quite likely that that's going to be a GMO uh, uh, crop. And that would not qualify for organic. That's not using organic seed or planting stock. Um, so that's being a little careless, I guess. Uh, a person needs to, if they want to avoid the GMO papaya, uh, you know, talk to the Hawaiian Organic Growers Association and find sources of organic papayas and organic papaya planting stock. Okay, um, just another comment about preventative measures. It says most conventional corn is treated, so a good cleaning job of the planter boxes is a point that can be missed. Right, um, and I, I mentioned that, but I appreciate the reinforcement. Okay, um, let's see. Let me just scroll down here and see if we have, we have time for one more question or so. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, what, okay, we already answered questions about buffers. We had quite a lot of questions about that. Um, okay. All right. Um, are there any recommendations for guidelines for what is typically considered remote fields for GMO purity in seed production considering both wind and, okay, you answered that question about the miles. Right, yeah, okay. it, it depends on the crop, but like I said, 660 feet for corn, but you know, something like soybeans are largely self-pollinated, so it doesn't need to be near as large an uh, isolation zone. Okay. If you're worried about, you know, you're concerned about uh, seed purity. Okay, is there a way to warrant the fidelity of non-GMO corn seeds sent overseas? Well, um, you know, certainly having representative samples and uh, working with, you know, one of the uh, uh, labs, you know, an outfit like Genetic ID um, would be the way to warrant that, I guess, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly. 
Okay. Well, we are running out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. And as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions, you can use the Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. Um, the webinar will be posted on the eOrganic website within the coming week at the website on the screen. That's extension.org slash organic under, um, underscore production under archived webinars. Thank you so much for coming again today, Jim, and thank you all for joining us. Yes, and thank you very much.